this stage of the season, it's not about patterns of play. It's about somehow making sure the ball goes in the back of the net of the opposition and keeping it out of your net and making sure that every single player finds form and is pulling in the same direction. And that isn't happening. Arsenal players are making those drastic errors now. Like, David Raya barely put a foot wrong since he came into Arsenal. I think you could look at the Raya signing and use it as an example to demonstrate that Mikel Arteta had the Midas touch. Everything that he did, every decision he made was totally correct. You've got David Raya comes in, some were suggesting that it would disrupt the back line, some were suggesting that it would that, that, that he wasn't even better than Aaron Ramsdale. All of a sudden, he's on course for the Golden Gloves. He makes his error now. He, he starts playing as a midfielder against Bayern Munich. Gabriel hasn't put a foot wrong all season. Suddenly, he's all over the place. He's all over the place, both against Bayern Munich and against Aston Villa. And I think it's also important to talk about Mikel Arteta here. Arteta's making errors. Arteta's substitutions when the game was nil-nil, really weird. Really weird. Substituting his best player when you desperately need to win, really weird. Is he rotating properly? Probably not. There are lots of questions about Mikel Arteta getting it wrong. And let's be totally frank, this is a part of the conversation that Arsenal fans always want to avoid. They will always try and be kind to their manager because they love Arteta. And, you know, they're, they're not wrong to love him. But because of their love, they are kind and generous to him. He got done. Arteta got so done by Unai Emery. Emery was brilliant. Emery got it right. Emery did everything that he wanted to do. He set up his team perfectly. And ultimately, the reason why Arsenal got beat 2-0 comprehensively at home by Aston Villa was because of the brilliance in the dugout from Unai Emery. Well, let's hear from his opposite number, Mikel Arteta, his reaction to that defeat to Aston Villa. Uh, that's time to, to to stand up and make yourself count. Uh, when you are winning and winning and winning, is it to come here? Is it to be in the picture? Is it to go in the crowd? Now is the moment. Uh, it's a beautiful moment that we're going to experience on Wednesday night. And it doesn't. It cannot come in a better time for us because to lift uh, the momentum and um, the way that we feel right now, we have the best possibility <coughs> to do that. He says now is the moment, and this was probably a question a lot of Arsenal fans will be asking themselves. They've been brilliant for so long in this campaign. We're now at crunch time, where the trophies are within sight. Is now the moment where they stand up and take it to the wire, or is it the moment where? They get deja vu from last season mm. and they fall away again. Well, it, well, at some point, the deja vu line you use is correct, isn't it? At some point, it isn't coincidence anymore. At some point, you constantly fail when it most matters. You constantly flatter to, to deceive. You constantly, nearly win the league. Something's going wrong. You know, Mikel Arteta managing for the first 30 games of the season is very different to him managing for the final six. And I feel like he makes pig's ear of those. I think he gets an awful lot wrong in those. And if you think about what Unai Emery did at the Emirates... It was perfect. He was he was cold. He was he was patient. He was aware of the brilliance of Arsenal. You know, he's very cautious, very careful, aware that they are flammable. And then when he smelt blood, it just went for the jugular. And that is excellent management from from Unai Emery. And it isn't the first time we've seen him slap Arsenal up this year before. So he's done the double over them this year. I doubt that Man City will win the league by six points if they do win the league. So Unai Emery has ultimately put a stop to Arsenal's uh, pursuit of the league. Equally, we've seen Unai Emery do it to Arteta before. We've seen him do it with Villarreal. You know that Unai Emery is a better manager than Mikel Arteta. You know that when his team comes up against... When when an Unai Emery team comes up against the Mikel Arteta team, Emery knows what to do. He knows how to find a victory. And, you know, we've spoken about Arteta certainly being culpable here. We've spoken about certain players for Arsenal that have been very good through the season that have found a little bit of... of have, have found some issues. But another major issue, it's the squad. It's the squad depth. Maybe he hasn't rotated enough throughout the season, but I thought that Emil Smith-Rowe trying to stop Ollie Watkins from scoring... Trying. Yeah, trying, using that word. Maybe I'm playing hard and uh, loose with the... Uh, with the definition of the word trying. Do you know what it reminded me of? Have you ever seen that clip that goes around social media a lot? I think it's at the old White Hart Lane, this uh, steward searching people as they go into the stadium, sort of trying to search. So <laughs> I not. know the one. It's exactly what, it's exactly what Emil Smith-Rowe did. It was, it was pathetic. It was, it was one of the most feeble attempts to stop someone scoring 
what could be a decisive goal in the title race. I, I cannot believe that Emil Smith Rowe is seemingly adored. What do they call him? The Croydon De Bruyne or some nonsense. I cannot believe that he allowed that to happen. Like, not only did he do nothing, but he didn't even try. Like, it's not like he got done. You know, sometimes as a footballer, you can get done. The other geezer's is too fast for you. The other geezer's is too strong for you. Yeah, the other yeah. geezer's is too skillful for you. It happens. Dan James, I remember, got done in a very similar way playing for Manchester United at Old Trafford, Mo Salah. Yeah, but trying to he tried. Him. Mo Salah just too strong for him. Mo Salah launched him. Uh, Coquelin got done by Hazard. But he tried. Emil Smith Rowe did as much to stop that goal as I did. And I was 200 miles away. <laughs> he did nothing. He, did, he literally, literally did nothing. He was a spectator. Tough afternoon for Arsenal. They'll have to pick themselves back up. Tough afternoon for Liverpool as well. Who uh, Crystal Palace, seemingly their bogey team as well. I mean, it's... It's been a tough week for Liverpool. Heavy loss at home to Atalanta. Losing at home to Palace. First loss at home in the league since October 22. Another club who are seemingly thinking now, have the wheels come off? And are we going to go from a season that promised so much, a quadruple, was up for grabs? Are they now going to end up with just the League Cup? Yeah, they are, I think. I think they fizzled out. I think I think they fizzled out. And I think that to try and understand why they fizzled out is, is very difficult. I, I think ultimately what it comes down to is the squad aren't as good as they need to be. And the dazzling size that we've seen before from Liverpool, the dazzling performance that we've seen from Liverpool, the dazzling achievements of Jurgen Klopp, have all been done partly through Klopp's genius and him turning very good players into the best in the world in their various positions. But these players aren't that. And even the genius of Klopp... Like, Darwin Nunes won't be the best centre-forward in the world in the way that Sadio Mane was the best in his position. Roberto Firmino was the best in his position. At various points... Jordan Henderson became the very best at what he did for that team. Genie went out, you know, we've seen it time and time again. Andy Robertson, a £7 million signing from Hull, becomes the best left back in the world. Darwin Nunes isn't going to be that bloke. It doesn't matter. Like, you can turn water into wine, but you need the water to begin with. And Darwin Nunes isn't it. Cody Gapo isn't that. So, ultimately, I feel like Klopp's done unbelievably well to still be in the race. And they are still in the race. But they have had... They have had a dreadful nine days. Yeah, Manchester United into Atalanta, into Crystal Palace. Like potentially, they say season weeks, defining. Yeah, yeah, a week's a long time in politics, is a saying, isn't it? It's an awful long time in football. If you think this time last week they were going to win a, a a treble, Klopp's treble as well. They were going to do it. They were going to go to Dublin for that party. Like well, that, that's over, isn't it? Like they, I know people like to think that Liverpool can somehow do it, and I. I should probably have learned not to write this Liverpool team off, particularly a Klopp's Liverpool team. But they aren't going to Bergamo and winning 4-0. They're just not. They've just been beat by Palace at home. They're just not going to do that. Well, well let's, let's hear from Jurgen Klopp, see what he had to say, his reaction to that defeat to Crystal Palace. It's not at the moment for me now to stand here and tell the world um, we will fight back. To honestly, it will be, that would not be honest. So we, we, It's easy to explain. We play like in the first half. Why should we be there? We play in the second half, we can win football games, if we can win football games, then we have to see how many. We have to be around when the others struggle, if they struggle at all, we will see that. And if not, we still have to need points for the Champions League, all these kind of things. So it's like, we have to play better football, that's my concern. And that for 95 minutes or 100 minutes, then it's okay. And then take what you get, it was always like that, but you should not play like we played in the first half, but it happened. And that I did, that I couldn't turn it around with the boys. That get this Atlanta game out of out of the system. Uh, yeah, that disappoints me personally a lot. But now I cannot change that anymore. You can almost hear the disappointment in his voice. I mean, it has been a tough seven, ten days for Liverpool. And first half, very average performance. Second half, much better. They actually had their highest ever Premier League expected goals. Ugh, what and are you on about? Didn't score. Yeah, I mean, yeah. This is the issue, isn't it, with these stats? You know, these expected goals and that. It it doesn't matter. It doesn't. Do you know? Do you know what it reminds me of? Sometimes, Topsy, I play a lot of a lot of poker, and there's various strategies that you should employ, and you can read all the books, and you can know what you should do, and you should take into account the variance. But ultimately, sometimes it's just you and another geezer in a room, and he is telling you something and he is doing something and you have to react and what you're expected to do matters not a jot and Liverpool potentially having 
lots of goals that they should have scored, tells us nothing because we know that. We know that Darwin Nunes is probably the most profligate striker in the league. Most shots, most big chances missed. Like, he... I just don't think that you... I just don't think that, uh, that Liverpool can be the team that they want to be with Nunes. I think he's a brilliant player for someone other than Liverpool. Or, the worst scenario is, he's good enough for Liverpool, in which Liverpool, which means that the Klopp era is over. Because the Liverpool team that we have come to understand over the course of seven years, you know, practically a decade, he doesn't get near that team. You know when they, you know when they were winning European Cups? getting to European Cup finals and being robbed that Ramos incident getting 97 points and not winning the league going again the following season and winning it earlier than anyone has ever won it that team that basically demanded the best from everyone at Anfield every I mean literally FSG down yeah. everybody was perfect everybody did exactly what they were supposed to do you can talk about FSG being brilliant you can talk about Andy Robertson being brilliant the keeper brilliant the forwards brilliant the, the tea lady brilliant every, literally everyone was perfect and suddenly we've got Darwin Nunes in the team. We're going, yeah, he's, he's good. You know, he does. He, he causes chaos. Chaos like, Nunes. What are you on about? Right? That's not a metric to, to comprehend a footballer. That's not. In fact, if it is a metric to comprehend a footballer, I think it's a bad one. Like genuinely, you know, like the best strikers that you've. Like if we take this away from Liverpool, the best strikers I've ever seen in the Premier League. I know. Um, Dennis Burkamp was brilliant. You'd never call him chaotic, would you? Thierry Henry was brilliant. You never call him chaotic. And if you did, if you did call a striker chaotic, it would be an insult. It, it would be an insult. God, he's a bit, he's all right, but he's a bit chaotic. And suddenly, we've we've changed the the connotations around the word chaotic to be positive, to accommodate Darwin Nunes and his and his terrible wastefulness in front of goal. I, th- I think that Liverpool need a new, they need a new striker, and I think Cody Gakpo can go as well. 